According to the CDC, every year over 300,000 Americans are infected with Lyme disease. The disease can be a devastating experience. What do you know about Lyme? Welcome to Nutrition Edge on ReachMD. I'm dietitian Kathy King. My guest today is Dr. William Rawls, physician in North Carolina, Lyme disease sufferer, and the author of two books on Lyme, Suffered Long Enough, and his newest one, Unlocking Lyme. He specializes in Lyme disease, fibromyalgia, and chronic illnesses, and he's now medical director of The Vital Plan. Bill, welcome to our program. Thank you very much, Kathy. Given your training in medicine, what did you learn by being a Lyme patient yourself? The biggest thing that I learned is it's not what people think it is. You know, most people come to the table, physicians included, with the idea that they've been infected by a microbe and that microbe is causing all of their illness and they must eradicate that microbe to get well. And I came to realize that it's never just Borrelia, the microbe that's commonly associated with Lyme disease. It's also a spectrum of other microbes that are present. And so it, it's not as much an infection with a microbe as it is a disruption of the entire microbiome associated with chronic immune dysfunction. And I think that once I started understanding it, that was really the key in, in getting well and overcoming it. I've heard that explanation, and it definitely is true. It changes how you think about the disease and about your health. Can you briefly explain about Borrelia, co-infections, biofilms, and how Lyme is diagnosed? Yeah, Borrelia is uh, the microbe that's commonly associated with Lyme disease. We have come to accept that if you don't have Borrelia, you don't have Lyme disease. But I'm beginning to see that there are many associated microbes with, with similar characteristics. We tend to trace Borrelia infections back to Lyme, Connecticut back in the 70s. But in actuality, the microbe has been with us for a very long time. They have found Borrelia very similar to today's microbe. Uh, locked in amber from the Dominican Republic inside a tick that's 15 million years old. It's been found in the mummified remains of a human that was thawed out of a glacier in the Italian Alps that's 5,000 years old. So we've been dealing with this microbe a very, very long time. And, and so when it comes to diagnosing it, you have to have a perception that it may be there. Our testing for these microbes are just really not very good. It will get better, but right now, testing for chronic illness is fair at best. A lot of new tests coming out, but most of those tests are geared toward testing for acute infection. So when you look at the population of people with Lyme disease, most people, when they pick up this microbe with a tick bite, they generally pick up that and others. It's a very quiet infection. Most people don't even notice it's happening. They don't notice the tick bite. So all of our testing is geared toward the acute infection, but most people don't realize when they have an acute infection, and most of the people being tested are testing for chronic infection. By then, the reaction by the immune system has been attenuated and the microbe is in very low concentrations in the body, so it's really, really hard to find. What symptoms do people usually experience and can they ever be cured? <laughs> cure, <laughs> cure is relative. When you look at Lyme disease or most any other chronic illness, your goal is helping the person return to a normal life. And I think that's primarily the goal. If the goal is to eradicate the microbes that are associated with the illness, then you're generally going to be unsuccessful. What we're finding is that most people are exposed to these different microbes. I think as our testing gets better, we're going to find that an awful lot of people are carrying Borrelia that aren't sick. And most people have some form of what I would classify as a stealth microbe, either mycoplasma, Bartonella, chlamydia, and there's a huge long list. And most people aren't symptomatic unless their immune system has been affected. So usually when I see a patient, when I talk to someone, they don't remember the tick bite. They gradually became ill, and I start putting together a story of a perfect storm of factors that disrupted their immune system 
around the time they became ill. So it's not as much the microbe as the factors that disrupt immune function. My business collapsed, and I underwent a divorce and was in an automobile accident about that same time, and my life just totally collapsed, and that's when the symptoms got initiated. Those are the chronic Lyme patients that I see. So once that vicious cycle of chronic immune dysfunction gets set up, these microbes are perpetuating. So when you look at symptoms, you've got to ask, what does a microbe want? Really, all the microbes want is to hang around, gather some resources until they can spread to another host. That's all they care about. They want to wait for another tick bite. So they must get nutrients from the body. One they really like is collagen. They can't get the collagen directly, so they manipulate the immune system. They manipulate inflammatory cytokines to generate inflammation in the body. So typically the symptoms are where you find collagen, eyes, brain, skin, joints, muscle, and heart. Heart irregularities, chest pain, brain fog, neurological dysfunction. They also like myelin, which is the thing that insulates nerves. So it's all of these diffuse symptoms that migrate around the body that are hard to put a finger on. That makes the illness really, really frustrating to to really define because there are so many different symptoms that come with it. I've seen Lyme patients, my daughter has Lyme, and I've seen Lyme patients in their 20s that have to use a cane to walk. Others, walking is no issue whatsoever. Others have peripheral nerve degeneration or what they think is that. It feels like that. So it does hit people in all different ways, in all different parts of their body. Correct. Is there ongoing Lyme research right now? There is a lot of research, and most of the research is geared toward finding the cure for Lyme disease, the thing that will kill Borrelia, the new antibiotic. And once you understand that it's not an infection with a microbe, then you start to move away from that. There's also a lot lot of research into diagnosis, and I think what we're going to find ultimately when we get really good at amplified DNA testing is that, one, Most people are carrying some of these microbes, and two, when you see this range of patients all the way from someone who is mostly functional to the other person walking with a cane, we're going to find that different strains of Borrelia act differently, but Borrelia acts differently in combinations with other kinds of microbes. Other stealth microbes like Bartonella, Mycoplasma, Chlamydia, and a whole range of others, plus viruses, and it's not the one microbe acting, it's the microbe acting in a spectrum of other microbes that cause this variability, great variability in the illness. You're listening to Nutrition Edge on ReachMD. I'm Kathy King. I'm speaking with physician and Lyme disease expert, Dr. William Rawls, and we're talking about Lyme disease. Bill, do you see many Lyme patients with mold sensitivities and diet or gut issues? And if so, do these ever go away or become controlled? It depends on the issue. Mold is a big issue. And again, when I'm evaluating a patient, I look for what I call immune system disruptors. And you can categorize those and to areas of, I list seven categories of immune disruptors that I look at. Food, diet, are they eating a processed food diet? What kinds of foods are they eating? Toxins and toxicants, natural toxins like mold are very, very prevalent in certain parts of our country. Other toxins, um, you know, I had a lady and her illness was initiated by moving into a house that they had saturated the house for termites with pesticides and she didn't know it. Emotional stress is a huge one for so many people. Physical stress, airline pilots are especially susceptible to these kinds of illnesses because they get so much radiation exposure and the stress of pressure changes and all of the other things that come with that kind of stress. So not sleeping, not sleeping on a regular cycle. So I go down the list of things that are affected. Gut issues are very, very common. And I think that is partly due to Borrelia, but most people seem to end up with mycoplasma. Mycoplasma infects gut lining. The high prevalence of gluten sensitivity that we're seeing today, I think, is partially due to 
these kinds of microbes affecting the gut lining and breaking down the barrier. So these very foreign proteins to cross over into the bloodstream and cause inflammatory symptoms. So a lot of symptoms of Lyme are also often rooted in gut issues. But I think that's a microbiome disturbance in the gut that's associated with that. Can these symptoms go away or be controlled? Sure. I have been able to get my life back completely. If you had talked to me 10 years ago, my situation was fairly desperate. Now at age 60, I'm living a normal life. I thought I would be having hip and joint replacements by now. My joints are in perfect shape. I no longer have chronic back pain or shoulder issues or neck issues. I'm living a great life. You know, I went kite surfing in the ocean yesterday. That's so exciting to hear. (laughs) Patients need to hear that. Yeah, and physicians need to hear that as well, that this can come under control. Going along with that, can a woman or man with Lyme safely have unprotected sex, or is this a new STD, and can a woman deliver a Lyme-free baby and breastfeed? That's a common question, and I think the expert opinion is that Lyme is not transmitted sexually, but I've seen enough families that all members of the family have the illness and test positive for Borrelia that I discount that. I think it's certainly possible for it to be spread in utero and and through sexual contact. But that being said, microbes specialize in transmission. Again, what the motive of the microbe is, is spreading from host to host. That's what they do. Making someone desperately ill is really against the mission of the microbe because that person can't get out and spread the microbe to other hosts. So when you look at Borrelia, it does have similarities to another spirochete called syphilis, which is certainly spread sexually. But interestingly, the microbe specialized in sexual contact. It concentrates in vaginal fluid and semen so that sexual contact is the primary way that it is spread. When you look at Borrelia, it's specialized in ticks. So semen concentrations are not particularly high. Vaginal concentrations are very low. It can cross the placenta, but it doesn't do so as readily as possibly syphilis. And so, yes, it can happen, but if it's given a choice, it's really designed to spread by tick. So reasonable precautions. If someone is very actively engaged in in going through Lyme disease, some kind of barrier protection such as a condom does make sense. And certainly if someone was considering pregnancy, I would recommend that they wait until they have their Lyme symptoms under control. And generally, if the symptoms are under control, even if you haven't eradicated the microbe, it's really occurring in very, very low concentrations in the body. That's good to hear. That's very encouraging for all the young people that do have Lyme. Are there triggers that can make Lyme disease symptoms return once it's been well controlled? Yeah, there's no doubt about that. Again, I'm not sure I've eradicated the microbe from my body. And again, I think we all have a spectrum of these microbes in the margins of our microbiome that have potential to cause this illness. And if you don't have a healthy immune system, you're going to run into various problems. These microbes are opportunists. They're always looking for an opportunity to flourish. And that's just the nature of the whole thing. That list of system disruptors, if you're eating a bad diet and sedentary and sitting in front of a computer all day and you don't do the things that you need to do to keep your immune system healthy, Mm -hmm. then it's coming back. Honestly, I found myself in that situation writing this book, Unlocking Lyme. Unlocking Lyme was probably a three-year book crammed into one year, and it's uh, heavily cited. I wanted to put the science behind it to make it the most credible book that I possibly could. And I was doing eight plus hours on the computer every day through last summer and last fall, and I found myself getting ill again. And I said, you know, I can't do this. I'm writing a book about Lyme disease. So I had to back off a little bit and get back outside more and watch my diet more and load up on the supplements and, you know, bounce back fairly quickly. You mentioned supplements, and you have them in the book. Would you explain what the main dietary supplements are that you suggest and why? Herbs, absolutely. I think herbs are the primary answer to this condition. 
And the reason I say that is you really have to pick the solution that fits the problem. If you are addressing pneumococcal pneumonia, you have a rapidly growing aggressive microbe that's consolidated in the lungs. And the proper therapy is putting that person in the hospital and giving them intravenous antibiotics. Antibiotics work very specifically and very acutely. When you look at Lyme disease, though, you're talking about a totally different thing. You're talking about not one microbe, but a spectrum of microbes. And these microbes are disseminated throughout the body. They're deep in the tissues. They're in very low concentrations. The symptoms of Lyme disease do not come from the microbe overwhelming the body. They come from the microbe manipulating the immune system. These microbes live inside cells. They manipulate the immune system by affecting inflammatory cytokines. They live in the recesses of the body. They grow very slowly. And when you look at that sort of thing, when you try to hit it with antibiotics, all they do is go into a dormant state and then come back out after the antibiotics are gone. So I like to think of using heroic therapy like an antibiotic as a race. And the race is, can you eliminate that targeted microbe before you disrupt all the flora in your body and depress immune function and actually cause more problems? And that's what you're up against with Lyme disease. It's hard to win that race. Pneumococcal bacteria, they're going through a generation every 12 hours. Borrelia, every 12 hours to 24 hours. So you're talking about a microbe that's behaving like normal flora in the body. So when you hit somebody with antibiotics for month after month after month after month, you're disrupting the microbiome even further, and so you're less likely to make them well. Herbs work perfectly because if you look at herbs, all plants are making antimicrobial substances, every plant. And the herbs are the things that we have been using for thousands of years that we found that mesh particularly well with our biochemistry. So herbs are doing two things. Herbs are producing a spectrum of chemicals that depress a wide range of microbes. It's more suppressive. I would never treat acute pneumonia with herbal therapy. That would be negligent. But when you look at these kinds of things, you get a suppressive effect because the herbs do not seem to affect normal flora, you can take them for a long time. I've been taking herbs for 10 years. Herbs also have the effect of suppressing these inflammatory cytokines, basically taking away the ability of the microbe to break down tissues. So it allows the immune system to start gaining ground and is able to suppress these things again and put them back in the box. Because when you look at it, there is nothing on earth that will get rid of these microbes completely other than your immune system. That is the only thing that can truly contain this kind of infection. So basically what you want to do is support the immune system's ability to do that. If you're not doing that, you're not going to get well. Um, And we typically don't use one herb, but use a spectrum of herbs to get a broad coverage. That sounds very interesting. I've heard a lot of people can handle the herbs. They seem to uh, set well on their stomach. They don't seem to have a problem. Is that true? Um, Yes. There are a lot of different herbs out there, and fortunately, um, many of them are beneficial for this. So you can usually work with a person and find a spectrum of herbs that they tolerate quite well. But herbs in general, especially the herbs that we're using for these kinds of conditions, are very forgiving and very well tolerated, and that's what makes them so special. When we look at therapies, I like to divide it into tiers for any patient. I divide it into restorative, symptomatic, and heroic therapies. Restorative therapies are the things that support the healing systems of the body and the immune system. Diet, exercise, generating endorphins, herbal therapy. These are the things that don't have a price. They don't have toxicity so that you can use them very freely for a long time. Symptomatic therapies are things that would be just for pain or sleep, sometimes the early stages these kinds of things can be very beneficial. And then heroic therapies, antibiotics would be in that therapy. But heroic therapies are what we do so well in conventional medicine. You break a leg, you have a stroke, you have a heart attack, acute pneumonia. 
we have the best system in the world for that because we have these heroic solutions that fix the problem. The problem with that is that drugs and surgery and other types of procedures have a high level of toxicity. So when you look at a comprehensive approach, helping the person build that restorative foundation using symptomatic therapy as you need it to control symptoms until the person heals and doesn't need them anymore, and then reserve those heroic therapies for when you really, really need them. With over 100, well, over 300,000 Americans being infected with Lyme each year, where can they find Lyme-aware physicians? What we're trying to do is put the solutions in the hand of the person. When you look at chronic Lyme disease, it's not an illness that's one in doctor's offices or hospitals. The person has to be willing and able to uh, do the things that they need to do to restore immune function. And a lot of that is that restorative foundation. So in the book and other resources, what we're trying to do is help people understand where the conventional medical system can really offer the most good, primarily symptomatic and heroic therapies, and how they can use their local resources to get well without having to fly across the country to see a specialist. There are Lyme specialists that they do have value, but they can be very expensive and they're not accessible to a lot of people. I was in a situation where my medical practice collapsed and finances were not good. I didn't have the option of going to fly across the country to see someone or to see a specialist. I had to use the things that I could bring to me through mail order, through the internet, using local providers and using my local medical system. And I was able to get well. I think that the biggest qualification for getting well with this illness is is the person being proactive, taking accountability for their own situation. So many people feel helpless and desperate, and they go from heroic therapy to heroic therapy and never get well. It's not until the person takes responsibility for their own situation and becomes proactive that they decide that they're going to get well and they're going to get their life back, then it actually happens. Sounds like attitude has a lot to do with that. Absolutely. Thank you for bringing us your Lyme disease insight. Our guest has been physician and former Lyme patient, Dr. William Rawls. We've been discussing unlocking Lyme. I'm Kathy King, and you've been listening to Nutrition Edge on ReachMD. Be sure to visit our website at ReachMD.com, featuring podcasts of this and other series. And thank you for listening. Dr. Rawls, thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Go to ReachMD and be part of the knowledge.